Hello YouTube friends, today I'm reacting to another food theory video. I'm not sure what the topic is, so let's jump right in. Good question, what was the best thing that your school lunch ever served? Seriously, right? Nothing. Oh, I'm just really fascinated by this topic. Because at my school, when I was growing up, the cream of the crop was known as cheesy dippers. They were literally just breadsticks with a bunch of cheese melted on them and meat sauce to dip. I read that as cheesy diapers, so I'm glad he said dippers. That's so gross. Anyway, I think the best thing my school lunch ever served was, like, chicken nuggets. I know in high school I always ate the salad, which was just sort of blah. But it was still better than the actual school lunch. So. Kids went crazy for these things. They showed up on the menu like every other Wednesday and the line was out the door for them. And it always confused me because, you know, they're just breadsticks and sauce. But little did Tot Pat realize at the time that those cheesy dippers, as well as all the other hot dogs, pizzas, and mystery meats that lunch lady Brenda was slopping down onto my plate were part of a grand conspiracy. A cascade of lies and backtalk. So eat up while you can, my friends. After today's episode, you'll never look at lunchtime the same way way again. Okay, I know I was ranting with my husband the other day about school lunches, so I'm really hoping this gives me the opportunity to repeat some of that rant, because our school lunches are really messed up, and the nutrition requirements that are packed in and that they force on schools just make it so much worse. I have some... <laughs> theories or solutions in my mind. So I'm hoping this might give me a chance to talk about them. And if not, I'll just plug them at the end. So stay tuned. Friendos, it's back to school season and with it comes the return of lunchtime. The time when clicks are formed that can make or break your school reputation. Or, you know, you could always be like me and reject the entire social hierarchy instead forcing yourself to sit at each individual lunch table one at a time as part of a grand social experiment to see which social clicks respond most angrily to an outsider encroaching on their territory. True story. Okay. Was lunchtime clicks like actually even a thing? Because I don't feel like it was in my school. Maybe I was just oblivious. Comment below if they were a thing at your school because I'm interested. That was my eighth grade science fair project. The self-classified sporty girls wound up being the worst. They threw food at me and they physically tried to lift me out of my seat for the entire hour in an attempt to get me to move. But science moves for no one. I locked my legs under the bench and held on for dear life. And you know what? It was worth it. Them throwing food resulted in me getting some free fries that day. And eventually I got myself a blue ribbon at the Ohio State Science Fair. So get dunked on there, Mallory, Courtney, Bethany, Catherine with a K, and other Bethany. Today though, we're not here to talk about the social he was not talking about me, just putting that out there. I didn't go to school with that pet, and it wasn't me. And I wasn't classified as a sporty girl anyway. I don't think I was a band geek of the lunchroom, we're talking about the food politics of the lunchroom. And while I think everyone would agree that healthier is better, the history of school lunches shows just how many competing interests exist in the competition over what little Jimmy is cramming into his pie hole come noon 30, sometime between phys ed and algebra. Case in point, this. A tomato. It's a fruit, right? I think that's pretty well established by now, but for decades when I was growing up, people were confused about that, constantly thinking that it was a vegetable. And their confusion was entirely justified, because, you know what, it was. So was ketchup. Yeah, so tomatoes are, okay, in the culinary world, they're classified as a vegetable because that's their function in food, but biologically speaking, they're technically a fruit. And that does make it inherently confusing because it's like, which classification are we going to use? And I think for school lunch purposes, they want to use the nutrition definition of things so it would be a fruit just to clarify so was pizza vegetable 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 so how was pizza possibly considered a vegetable well it all began here in the school cafeteria you see the origin of america's nationwide school lunch program actually dates back to 1946 when it was considered to be a matter of national defense no joke well it's true that some schools in the u.s did offer their students food as early as 1894 it didn't become something that public schools were legally required to do until the passage of the national school lunch act this was right after world war ii 
And during the war, they found that a large number of enlistees who could have otherwise been eligible for service ended up being disqualified due to their poor nutrition. Yeah, apparently the thing that got the government to stand up and make feeding kids a priority was realizing that emaciated Americans wouldn't be able to die for their country. So instead, they decided to feed them up and then ship them out. But regardless of the reasons that actually got the thing to start, people immediately drew a liking to it. Parents across the nation were more than happy to take a break from slapping together some PB&Js, so school lunch programs got bigger throughout the rest of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. There was the school breakfast program, the child and adult food care program, the special milk program. You know what, I'm just gonna come out and say it, there's something I inherently don't trust about the phrase special milk. But not only did the parents like it, the government did too because it solved another problem that they had. Namely, that the US had itself a surplus of domestic produce and didn't exactly know what to do with it all. I've actually talked about this in a previous theory about America's secret supply of underground cheese, which if you haven't watched, make sure you check out that episode after this one. But basically school lunches were one place that they could offload a bunch of that extra cheddar. Feed kids will also- Yeah, the dairy industry has always had a hold in our school lunch programs. And I think that's part of a larger issue. Anyway, I do feel like school lunches still serve a lot of the same purposes that they did even when it was just getting started because a lot of students don't actually get the opportunity to eat well at home or in some cases to eat enough at home and so it does serve an opportunity still to address that issue and to give kids regardless of their resources outside of school, it gives kids an opportunity to eat. And anyway, so I do think, although the way that has looked has evolved over time, that is still an issue that I wish the public were still more aware of because it is a huge problem. A lot of students don't actually have enough food outside of school which is why I don't think we should be pushing the nutrition standards and agenda so hard on schools as we do, but hopefully I can get more into that later using up your surplus cheese. Two birds with one Swiss. And cheese was hardly the only example of this. I mean, I don't want to say that the school lunch program was just a convenient dumping ground for all the extra unsold food that nobody wanted to actually buy. I don't want to say it, but you know, a lot of times throughout the history of the school lunch program, it kind of ended up being true. For instance, when the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, was faced with that dairy surplus, they initially bought the cheese, right? And put it into the caves and eventually it became part of my cheesy dippers. Fine. But then they had a realization. Hey, those cows that keep producing so much milk that we can't figure out what to do with? Oh yeah, they're also beef. Suspicious look over at the cows and thus the whole herd buyout program of the 1980s was born. School lunches suddenly took the form of burgers and pizza and anything that could make use of beef and or cheese. So where then does the school lunch conspiracy come in? Nutrition. Did that say with real beef flour? Okay, I just have to back this up a little bit because what was that milk carton? <laughs> okay, with real beef flavor. I was like, oh my gosh, what did this? Yeah, okay. Maybe these contacts work. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> the milk with beef flavor. Okay, is it just me? Or also did the milk cartons that they give you, like those little milk cartons at school, did they taste awful? And now, like, I really... I still prefer nut milks over dairy milks, if I'm gonna be honest. But when I'd actually drink these things, I wasn't allergic and they still tasted awful. Let me know in the comments below if you agree or if you were actually a fan. Cause again, I'm just interested. So where then does the school lunch conspiracy come in? Nutrition. You see, even though surplus was certainly one driving factor dictating what was and wasn't getting served as a part of school lunches, the other was nutrition. School lunches had to at least be nutritious. And because meal regulations still stated that kids had to be served two full servings of vegetables with their school lunch, everything was just hunky-dory, right? Right? Well, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that those who set the definitions around food don't always do so in an impartial way. I mean, our vision of a healthy diet used to look like this with the grains being the foundation of a healthy, balanced meal. Conveniently, it was also the cheapest type of food to serve up. I mean, I've already done a whole video about the very- Yes, and we actually reacted to this video as well, so if you're interested, you can watch it after you finish this one.
various competing forces that got the food pyramid to look the way that it did. But suffice it to say, for a long time, the guiding principle was eat more carbs. Come to think of it, the food pyramid was created by the USDA, the same USDA that was responsible for the school lunch program in the first place. So the same organization that comes up with the lunches also gets to come up with the nutrition rubric that those lunches need to be graded on. Surely, no. Okay, I appreciate that he is calling out how shady the USDA can be because I feel like some people just wholeheartedly put their trust in them as having our best interest at heart. And I don't feel like that's true. They have a lot of conflicting interests, so it's good to have your eyes open. And this is definitely one of those things where it's like, there are far too many conflicting interests going into their decisions about what to promote as far as what American citizens should be eating. And they happen to have a lot of control over what kids in school can and should be eating because they have full control really over what is offered in the first place potential for bias or conflict of interest there, right? Well, in 1979, USDA guidelines were loosened to the point that nutrition standards for school lunch items only had to meet the minimum requirements, rather than the stricter requirements of being quote-unquote officially healthy. So, how minimum is a minimum standard? Well, one USDA official is said to have explained it as follows, quote, if a candy bar has only one nut in it, we feel it is above our minimum nutrient standards. In other words, things ain't looking too great. But, at the very least, they still have that two-vegetable rule, right? That ensures that even though a peanutty baby Ruth might have gotten served up as a side next to your mac and cheese, you at least have some green beans and carrots on the plate to balance it all out. Well, let's pull up what I said a few seconds ago. Quote, kids have to be served two full servings of vegetables with their school lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to play a game. You see, that's what the regulations said, except it presents a problem. Produce, it's expensive. It's expensive to store at the correct temperatures. It doesn't keep for very long periods of time. It takes varying times to prepare and it needs to be shipped under proper conditions, usually within specific seasons. Remember, we're talking about technology from the late 70s and early 80s to get all this done. As if that wasn't bad enough, serve Surveys of school lunch waste repeatedly show that vegetables are the item that kids leave unused and throw out the most often. So in essence, what you're dealing with is the food item that's generating the highest cost and also has itself the lowest return. It's only there because parents expect healthy vegetables to be offered to their kids by the school. It has to be on the menu. The regulations say it. Then again, words can be open to some creative interpretation. So if you're a government agency in the 80s whose funding has just been slashed 30% by the president and you're looking to save money on school lunches while still technically meeting the letter of the law, where in this sentence do you think there might be some wiggle room? That, my friends, is the game we're playing today. I'll give all you budding politicians a second to think it over. <laughs> also, just throwing in my guess is this is where things like ketchup counting as a serving of vegetables is going to come in. Pretty sure ready? Great. Solution number one, the word right here, vegetable. Vegetable already has itself a nebulous definition, which is an episode to itself on another day, but suffice it to say that the administration at the time was eager to use that murkiness to their own advantage. In an attempt to meet the letter of the law in technicality, but not necessarily in spirit, the USDA tried to list the ingredients of condiments to help boost up the number of vegetables that were being served to the kiddos in school. Ketchup? Well, if you read the label, it says tomato right there. That's a vegetable, right? Count it. Pizza? Well, that's not just any sauce, my friend. That is tomato sauce. Count it. Packets of relish. That right there, friends, is a serving of cucumber. And that is the story of how ketchup almost became a vegetable. Almost. If it seems to you like this school lunch program strategy was a wee bit on the cheaty side, you're not alone. It became a national debate that culminated in Pennsylvania Senator Henry J. Heinz III. Yep, Heinz, as in the Heinz brand ketchup dynasty. Apparently the family moved into politics, go figure. Delivered a speech from the U.S. Senate floor saying, quote, ketchup is a condiment. This is one of the most ridiculous regulations I ever heard of. And I suppose I need not add that I do know something about ketchup and relish, or did at one time. The New York Times described the whole thing as the emperor's new condiments, and eventually the USDA withdrew what would come to be known as the ketchup proposal. Except we're still playing this game and we haven't solved the problem. We still gotta cut costs while meeting the letter of the law. So let's look again at our sentence. Kids have to be served two full servings of vegetables with their school lunch. If you can't change a condiment into a vegetable, why not try swapping the labels on something? 
something else. And that's when they found their new loophole. This word right here, serve. The USDA adopted new guidelines, still largely in use today, based around the offer versus serve model, which is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of being required to serve a certain helping of vegetables, what if school lunch programs were only required to offer a certain helping of vegetables? And since kids were making the choice, they could be safely relied on to decline said offer. The defense of that position is that serving vegetables to kids doesn't do much good if the kids are just gonna chuck those vegetables right into the trash. And so this became a major cost-cutting measure. Schools could suddenly keep a bare minimum of produce on hand and justify it in the name of reducing waste by listening to feedback. So was that the end of our ketchup is a vegetable debate? Yeah, at least it was. Okay, I know people are gonna have mixed feelings on this, but I feel like it's not necessarily a bad model to offer kids food and allow them to accept or reject. And there are some caveats to that, obviously. Like, if you're wanting kids to accept vegetables, they need to actually be high quality. I know our schools would actually offer <laughs> or serve the green peas out of a can that were absolutely disgusting and similar items that really just weren't very palatable. And honestly, even still, those things are just being thrown away. So us assuming that things have gotten better, I don't think that's very true. And being required to serve it isn't going to make the kids actually eat it. I know there were, yeah, there were lots of lunches where I really wouldn't eat anything because it was just gross. And if you're wanting to give kids something nutritious, it's only as good as far as it gets. So if they don't actually consume that food, what good is offering them nutritious food in the first place? Not to mention the fact that these kids are in a stage of life where they are actively growing. They need plenty of calories in, addis in addition to their nutrition. So focusing so intently on meeting specific nutrient requirements doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because it seems more valuable to be giving them food that they will eat and use and encouraging them to build their ability to eat intuitively than to force disgusting food on them because it meets nutrition requirements. Just saying was until today. You see, this whole sordid history got me curious. Does ketchup actually have enough tomato in there to count as a serving of vegetables? Like, sure, we're all fine to laugh at how stupid this whole thing was and acknowledge that it was a bit shady as far as cost-cutting measures are concerned. Then again, I've seen the Heinz commercials. They squeeze more than 25 whole red ripe tomatoes into a bottle. So I reached into the fridge and pulled out my bottle of I'll do it, get <clears throat> the uh, Heinz tomato ketchup to do some math. Based on info from eatforhealth.gov, of a single vegetable serving is 75 grams or one medium-sized tomato. Now, the ad here says that there are 25 tomatoes in a 40-ounce bottle of ketchup, so you would assume that a whole bottle of ketchup is going to be serving 25 vegetables, right? Eh, not so much. We don't know how big those tomatoes are. They could just be 25 whole red ripe cherry tomatoes. In 2015, Heinz was actually sued in Israel by local ketchup producer Osem on the grounds that they utilized too much high fructose corn syrup in their products, thereby not qualifying for the name ketchup under Israeli nutrition standards. Reports from the case estimated that the amount of tomato in this tomato-based product was between 17 and 39 percent, depending on the lab that was doing the testing. Luckily, the nutrition label for Heinz is much more helpful than the label for something like pink sauce. It tells us that there are 148 grams worth of tomato to make 100 grams of ketchup. And yeah, that might seem weird to have more tomato for less ketchup, but remember that things lose mass as they're cooked. Anyway, if you had a whole 40-ounce bottle of ketchup, that would be- Yes, I'm so glad that you pointed that out. And like there is actually quite a bit of tomato in ketchup, but you also have to keep in mind that there are other things like acid and high fructose corn syrup, or I'm not sure if they use sugar in certain places or not. I know sometimes high fructose corn syrup and sugar are used in different locations in order to sell to different markets and I'm not sure what ketchup does. But fun fact, did you know that Heinz actually uses the solids left over from, so the solid byproduct left over from their making ketchup to make bioplastic? 
that was something I found out not terribly long ago, but I feel like that's pretty cool. Side note about 15 servings of vegetables. It would also be nearly 1,500 calories to get those vegetables, considering all the extra sugar and stuff in there. We're also not accounting for bioavailability and all that, so take the estimate with a grain of salt. Anyway, a vegetable is a vegetable, right? So in theory, in food theory, by the numbers, you could argue that by grabbing a bottle of ketchup and chugging away, you were potentially satisfying at least the raw materials quotient of getting some vegetables. Then again, remember, when it came to school lunches, the lawmakers were talking about ketchup packets. So how many packets would the typical student need to eat in order to get a single serving of vegetables based on the USDA proposal? At minimum, you're looking at nine. Eight and a third if we're being precise. Hope you brought some tater tots for that huge pool of ketchup. Pizza, meanwhile? Yep, still considered to be a vegetable, actually, if there's enough sauce on it. In 2012, the Obama administration unsuccessfully attempted to raise the minimum veggie requirements back up for the first time in, like, forever. Under guidelines first proposed in 2010 aimed at curbing childhood obesity, frozen pizzas of the type typically served by the slice in school lunches could retain their serving of vegetables title if the sauce quotient was bumped up to half a cup of sauce as opposed to just two tablespoons. Except yet again, people- Okay, but speaking of, with frozen pizza, it makes zero sense to me that we couldn't just, you know, add some bell pepper or other vegetables that would help meet these requirements. Because kids would still eat it. They, like, pizza was one of the most popular school lunches, at least in my school. Again, let me know if your opinions are different, but I still feel like they would eat it and freezing your vegetables as part of a pre-made pizza is actually a really simple and effective way to include vegetables and actually help them retain their nutrients. So I don't understand why that's not a thing because it is always like cheese or pepperoni pizza. Let me know if your school actually had veggies on your pizza, because I've never heard of that. Solid problems with that. ConAgra, which supplies an estimated 75% of frozen pizza to U.S. schools, argued that over-saucing their product would make the kids not want to eat it, and then they spent $6 million lobbying the government to convince lawmakers of that exact fact. And thus, school pizza remained the dry, bready square that it's been for decades. Or, ConAgra, you could just go the route that my elementary school did and rebrand the whole thing as cheesy dippers, no sauce required, boom, just saved you $6 million in lobbying the government. In the end, the point of all of this is to show you how tricky school lunches really are. There's always this tough back and forth happening between what parents want their kids to eat, what kids actually want to eat, how much schools and governments want to spend to make those sorts of choices possible, and the companies who are involved that turn a profit over whatever the outcome is. So in the end, just remember this one thing. The next time your mom tells you you need to eat your vegetables, you say back, I need to eat more of this pizza to get enough tomato paste so it adds up to a full serving. If you manage to get away with that one, you're going to have yourself a great career in politics. But hey, that's just just a theory. A food theory. Okay. I'm gonna have to gather my thoughts a little bit after this one. This is totally a little bit, at least what I was talking about with my husband the other day. Because no matter what you offer kids, that doesn't always reflect on what they actually eat. And I am really interested in knowing what our current food waste from school lunches actually looks like, like how much students are actually eating. Because I know the Obama administration was actually successful in changing some of the school food regulations. And it definitely resulted in a downturn in food in my school, which didn't lead to students actually eating more nutritious lunches. It led to more food being thrown away which is just ridiculous to me because I don't feel like it was that bad to begin with. And my school definitely had a lot more variety and options that were actually given to the students. And students made different choices based on their own needs. But I'm not aware of any students who are sitting in the school cafeteria and just absolutely binging on all the foods that they're offered. Like, that doesn't happen. And yes, students might not have a plate that looks like my plate, but they also don't need it. 
all of our bodies are different. All of our bodies require different things. What you're eating at home tends to look a lot different than it does in school. And frankly, the fruit and veggies that you get offered outside of school tend to be a lot more delicious than what you're offered in school because of the problems that he brought up, where it is just harder for schools to offer fruits and veg that actually taste good. So if students aren't going to eat that there, I feel like we should focus on offering them food that tastes good enough that they'll actually eat it. Because students, the primary problem for students isn't childhood obesity. It is actually getting enough food and having the food security that they require to grow and function properly. And the students who do struggle with that are the ones who are going to eat more when they can. And you will see issues like them being categorized as struggling with childhood obesity because it's more of a nuanced issue than we've given it credit for. So my end take on this is that we should be focusing on giving students not just nutritious foods. I think we should be giving them fruits and veg where appropriate and where possible for the school systems to offer it. But our primary goal should just be making sure that our students actually eat enough. Because if we're primarily throwing away the food that tastes disgusting, then what's the point? These are growing kids who need enough calories. And yes, they need nutrients too. Hopefully we can balance that out. But I think the primary goal to fix the solution at this point should be offering food that actually tastes good. Because a lot of the things that even were popular, like pizza and chicken nuggets and cheesy dippers, don't really taste good. They're just relatively better than the other school lunches. Anyway, part of me really wants to do like a GoFundMe to research how much food waste is happening and what school lunches need a rework and then get a team of food scientists together to rework the gross meals so that they a meet the nutrition requirements and b are actually palatable this is a dream of mine hopefully one day i can make it happen anyway if you're interested in watching the video that he mentioned earlier i'll just link it here and we'll see you next time